There are 300 prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. These were earmarks that God gave us to recognize the Messiah when he came. Here are a few. Micah 5.2, the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13, the Messiah betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 22, 16, the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm 22, 18, the Messiah's clothes would be gambled away. Psalms 34, 20, the Messiah's bones would not be broken. Isaiah 37, 31, the Messiah would be born in the tribe of Judah. Hosea 11, 1, the Messiah would be called from Egypt. And finally, Isaiah 53, 9, the Messiah would be buried in a rich man's grave. The odds of Jesus fulfilling the predictions and living and proving the messianic prophecies to be true are virtually incomprehensible. A mathematician put it this way, suppose we filled the entire state of Texas with silver dollars three feet high. Then we mark only one coin with an X. The marked coin could be anywhere in the state. Say we blindfold a man then and we drop him over Texas, which seems cruel, in in which he has the entire state to choose one random coin. What would be the odds of him finding that marked coin in one try? He would have about the same chance the prophets had for those eight prophecies that I just read of being fulfilled which is virtually no chance. Let's take a look at a very specific prophecy of the birth of Christ from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you've ever watched the movie A Christmas Story, and who hasn't? I mean, it's literally plays for 24 hours straight on TBS on Christmas Day. If you've seen it, you know that Ralphie was the target of the bully Scott Farkas. Often, Ralphie and his buddies were confronted with this bully whom Ralphie firmly believed had yellow eyes. A lot like Ralphie, Israel at this time was controlled by a neighborhood bully. King Ahaz, who was daily inflicting pain on them, and there was nothing they could do about it. Ahaz had made an alliance with Assyria, and Ahaz became king of Judah at the young age of 20. He ended up reigning for 16 years. He set up idols and images of foreign gods and committed abominations by worshiping these gods. He even worshiped the god Molech by offering his own children. He was a terrible king, and Israel paid the price for it. At the time of these words were spoken to the people, they probably thought this was a prophecy of a good king to replace that bad king, King Ahaz. Truly, Isaiah 9-6 was a prophecy of a good king to come, but God waited over 700 years to send that good king. When you're being bullied, it's not the physical punishment that bullies dish out that is so overwhelming. It's that they destroy your hope. They take away any hope that your life will get better. And as we study the names of Jesus and the prophecies of Jesus in this passage, we run into a very important one um, when a bully is in charge. He will be called Mighty God. We need one who will stand with us when we face the bullies of life. Let's break the name Mighty God down a little bit. The Hebrew for Mighty God means El Gibber. Kind of a funny name. But El in our passage um, is, you might know it as El meaning God. And El speaks specifically to Jesus' divinity, that he would not, um, that he would be not only um, God's son, but that he he would actually be God. Many people and religions are willing to say that historically Jesus was a prophet and a good man and even the son of God, but not God, not divine. This very fact that Jesus claimed to be God, calling himself the I am, was a lightning rod while he walked among the earth, and it was the very thing that got him crucified. It was the biggest of deals, 
And it's predicted right here in Isaiah 9.6. The second part, mighty, is the Hebrew word gibber. So it means mighty warrior. So Jesus is the God who would fight for us. Jesus is the overcomer of all things, including the bullies every one of us face. I think about three common bullies we all face. First is this, it's really simple and broad. The bully of life. Life and living in this world can be a bully. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Bullies are more than just oversized schoolyard brutes. They come in all forms. They appear as big and small problems in our life that kind of beat us down. A broken down car, maybe, or a gossiping coworker, or the CAT scan result you're waiting on, or just flat out persecution for your faith. These are what I call peace robbers in our life. Jesus tells us, though, that here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but we can have peace in him in spite of all those things. Our idea of peace is often that bullies go away quietly, or better yet, that God vaporizes them, that he would remove any bad circumstance or challenging obstacles or people in our life. God may do that, but there is no promise of it. Our peace is in the fact that if we allow Jesus, he will walk with us in the middle of all of our pain. He'll be the fourth man in the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My wife and I often travel around in a RV. I'm not exactly what she would call outdoorsy. You might refer to me more as a glamper than a camper. I did some tent camping when I was younger and a youth pastor. And to be honest, I don't have a lot of fond memories of roughing it. You know who wasn't a glamper? Jesus. Right at the beginning of the book of John, it speaks of the Christmas story, but not in a way we usually think of. It's not as warm and as fuzzy as other places in the gospel, but it's gritty and real. John 1.14 says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love this phrase, dwelling among us. Dwelling is the Greek word for it. Askenison is the Greek word. And it means tabernacled, sojourned, or pitching your tent. With Jesus, there was no glamping. Jesus dwelled among us in the dirt. He pitched his tent right next door to us. He chose to come down in the middle of our mess at just the right time in the darkest part of history. He was with us. Maybe the thing I love most about Jesus is that he walks with me through all of my life, in all of my dark times, in all of my dirt. In 2005, I was having what could only be described as a dark night of the soul. I was in a bad head-on collision. When I came to consciousness, I was hanging upside down by my seatbelt, and they were cutting me out of the cab of my truck with the jaws of life. My first conscious thought was not, am I okay, but rather, did I kill someone in this accident? I suffered from what's called retrograde amnesia. It was a complete day that was lost in my memory. I didn't remember anything, and it created a lot of panic and anxiety in me. I was told there was a teenage girl who was driving the other vehicle, and she was life flighted to a nearby hospital. The girl ended up being just fine, but that next week there were a number of anxiety-ridden moments as we had no details on this girl's condition. My wife had smartly alerted my best friend Ron from Indiana, and something happened that changed me. His young daughter, Heidi, called me. Uh, Ron had told her what had happened to me and the internal hell I was going through of wondering if I'd been responsible for taking a life. I don't know why his daughter called me, but all I heard on the other end of the phone was sobbing and her sweet little voice saying, I'm so sorry, Jonathan. No sage words, 
she just anointed my weary soul with the ministry of with, of being with. She suffered with me. I've never experienced a greater healing moment like that. Jesus is that tender, mighty warrior who put on flesh to be with us in the dark nights of our soul, to go through what we go through. Whether God shows up through another person like this little girl or not, he always is with us and confronts the bullies of life. The second bully that is common to all men is sin. We face it constantly. We know that through the cross and the the resurrection that Jesus ultimately defeats sin. As humans, the reality is that we are daily confronted with the temptation to sin. Satan is this bully who first entices us and tempts us. And then when we give into it, he turns around, points the finger at us and blames us, telling us we aren't worthy to serve God. So just give up. Jesus didn't just overcome the world and the hardships that we encounter, but he overcame sin. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15 says this, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And verse 16 goes on and says this, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I want to point out two really encouraging things in this passage. The first is this. Jesus can relate to our temptation. Did you catch that? He's been tested in every way that you and I have been tested. So he understands us. He understands our weaknesses. He can sympathize and completely relate to what we're going through. We often believe that no one has ever been tried, no one's ever been tested or tempted like 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 we have. But not only has everyone, because temptation is common to man, everyone has been tempted like you have, but Jesus himself was. Sin separates us from God, but it also keeps us in this belief that we're all alone. And that's a terrible thought. That's a punishing thought that we have, that we're all alone. When I read this passage, I clearly understand I'm not alone. Jesus is there. Jesus has been there. And here's the second comforting thought. There's grace for you. Just because Jesus was tempted and didn't sin doesn't mean we won't sin. Just thinking, well, Jesus did it, and so can I, I guess, if he's done it. That's not enough. But look at verse 16 again. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Jesus is the mighty God of breakthrough for our sin. He is the mighty God who forgives our sin and gives grace as well as the power to resist it. That's encouraging. I want to give you a third bully. I call it the bully of death. We have the bully of life, all the circumstances of life, the the bully of sin, and then the bully of death. And it's the biggest bully of all in our life. Death is the fate of all men, and it looms there for us no matter who we are, how old we are, who our father was. It's always there, and it's probably a week we haven't gone, we've experienced where we didn't think of death and our own death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57 is kind of this resurrection chapter, right? It says, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how Jesus took away the sting of death. The moment sin entered the world, the curse of Adam spread to every living thing on the earth, even the earth itself, for all time. Because we 
on our own, we're unable to follow the law. God had, um, he had to send Jesus into the world. He was tempted in every way that you and I were tempted, but he never sinned. He, he did this so that he would be a spotless, sacrificial lamb for all people for all time. On the cross, he took the whole, whole world's sin for all time. Every sin that you and I have ever committed was laid upon Christ on the cross. He took it, he took it all so that you and I didn't have to. But not even that was enough. When Jesus died, he overcame death by the resurrection. Sin and death were swallowed up in it when he rose from the grave. You don't have to fear death. If you're in Christ, you don't have to fear death. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you don't have to fear death because he is a mighty warrior who has already defeated death for you. Recently, we had a friend of ours at Calvary die in a single car crash. She was four months pregnant with their first baby. They had tried so hard for so long to have a baby. And as unbelievably tragic as that is, I'm so glad that for Jamie and our child, that's not the end of the story. C.S. Lewis writes in this very last paragraph of the Chronicles of Narnia series, he says this, and as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and which every chapter is better than the one before. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for a season where we specifically remember that you came to destroy the bullies in our in our life. You came to destroy the bully of life itself and the hardship of life and the bully of sin in our life and that you overcame it and the bully of death and you overcame that and you overcame it for Jamie. Lord, thanks that you dwelt among us and you live in our mess and you're not afraid of us and the mess we've made. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're our Savior and our Lord. And we take a moment just to surrender to you now. Recalibrate our life so that you're once again on the throne. And we seek your forgiveness. We thank you that we can boldly go to the throne and that there is mercy and grace for our sin. In your name, we pray.